Welcome to another episode of FTK Over the Air. I'm Justin Tolman here at Xtero, and this is a twice a month podcast that we release about every other week. We try to keep that schedule, don't we, Lynn? We try so hard. We try so hard. <laughs> But Try to we're going to do better. We're going to do better. And we've only missed, I think, twice so far. And th th there's been a slightly larger space, but that shouldn't happen too often. But the thing is, we're taking as much care as we can to make sure we have some cool guests, some informative guests, some guests that have a lot to add to the content. Because while Lynn and I are really cool, it's the guests that you care about, I think. Correct. That's really why people are here. They are not here for us. I hate to break it to you. <laughs> no, don't tell me that. Okay. But, <laughs> so this this episode, though, this week, we have got Brett Shavers, which was really cool to, to chat with. Tell, tell me a little bit about him. I would love to tell you all about Brett because he is fascinating. Um, if you are new to the wild world of Brett Shavers... By the end of this podcast, you will be adding his books to your Amazon cart. Trust me, okay? Uh, Brett has a really neat life and a neat career, and he's super humble about it, which I just love. It. It's so charming, but he really should he really should pump himself up a little more because he's got just such an amazing, amazing experience in his life. Um, so he's a digital forensics examiner, right? Um, his law enforcement career is involved, you know, investigating cybercrime and serving as a consultant and an expert witness and, you know, consulting in civil litigation cases. Um, he's done private cons um, consultation with government agencies, law firms, you know, internal employee matters and class action litigation suits, right? He's done, he's done all types of cases. Um, he's also a teacher. So he's taught digital forensics uh, and investigative techniques to, I mean, literally dozens of law enforcement agencies internationally. So he's internationally known. Um, and he's taught a lot at a lot of graduate level educational programs as well. Um, he, we, we talk about that in the podcast. Um, and again, the cool part is that he's an award-winning author of uh, several respected digital forensics books. Uh, I think the one we're going to talk about today is Placing the Suspect Behind the Keyboard, which we love this topic. So we love talking about that. Um, and then he does have another book in the works right now. It's a, something very top secret, very scandalous, and very exciting. Um, and maybe we can convince him to give us a few details about that on today's episode. Okay, let, that's our goal today. Let's see if he can give us some some scoop on his new book that he's working on now. Um, he also manages his own training website. It's www.dfir.training. And that's actually a free resource for the forensics community. So check that out for sure. He has his own website as well, uh, www.brettshavers.com. So he's an author, a trainer, an expert witness, a forensic community content creator, right? He does so many things. It's like it's like faster than a speeding bullet. That's actually true, Justin. You once saw him outrun a bullet. <laughs> I think that's yes. true. Oh, yeah. Right. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Brett oh, yeah. Shavers, right? Uh, I think th this is the part that I would like you to, to cover too. I think even cooler than that is like the way he describes his life, uh, even on his website, his sort of about me webpage. Um, yeah. Will you share that with us? Because that I think is going to give everybody a pretty good picture of who Brett Shavers is. Yeah. So we looked at his website, you know, get an idea of what he's been about for the last little bit, you know, cause you want, you want to know before, so you don't look like you're unprepared. We've been, stalking him on his own resources for a while now. Totally, and, uh, totally stalking him. But I love the about me page because normally when you make a list of like your bio, um, cause I speak at conferences, so they're like, yeah, I got to send us a bio. Okay. And you go through and you do your thing. The like most important thing is like typically first, like maybe what you are doing now or your certifications or something. Right. I love on his about me. Right. I'm currently yeah. currently serving as a consultant for the, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. It's like, okay. Uh, no, not, not with Brett. This will give you an idea about his personality. I think the first thing on the list is swam with sharks. And um, so yeah, cool. he told me the story. I'm not going to, I'll let, of course him tell his own stories, but uh, it's just so fun. Like who? Yeah. Swam with sharks. Um, then he has some of his stuff from uh, he's former military in the Marines and uh, obviously law enforcement. But one of the things that he put on there was dined with crime bosses. 
which I, I didn't ask him about in, in the discussions that we've had, but what do you think they ate? Oh, see, like, I, I didn't even think of liver. Like, I don't know. Yeah. What? It, I don't know. Hopefully something fancy, you know? <laughs> um, of course he's, he's had, uh, he did a lot of undercover work. So he's, he mentions in his bio that he's been shot at, stabbed and beaten all of which things most people try to avoid. And I'm sure he tried to avoid it as well, but uh, he's hunted wild boars and been chased by them at the same time. Oh yeah. So. I, I live in Northeast Florida, which is right over the Georgia border. And yeah, wild boars, you don't mess with those. They are incredibly nasty. So yeah, if Brett has had close encounters with wild boars, that tells you something about what he's seen <laughs> and done. Yeah. Yeah. So, he also says he's driven really fast chasing violent felons. And here's the thing. I was, I've was i worked in law enforcement, but I was always a cyber analyst. So they don't let us out much, right? And definitely the amount of car chases that the cyber guys get involved in is, is pretty small. But that having been said, um, while I was interning at the Lafayette, Indiana Police Department years and years ago... Um, I don't remember if we were going to a case or if we were going to lunch or whatever it was, but I, I'm in, I'm in the detective. <laughs> Equally as yeah, important. Yeah, yeah. He doesn't really matter. Right. right? But we were, <laughs> I was with the detective I was working with and he's in his, of course, his uh, car. And we got a call that somebody had got into an altercation at a gas station and had fled the scene. And we actually saw them come through our intersection and, and go the other yeah. way. So, uh, ran code, turned on the lights, right? Ran through the intersection, sped down the road after them. They just, they pulled over fortunately. So it was very safe and I didn't, you know, it wasn't crazy, but just that small, like two block going through a red light on the turnaround. It's exhilarating. Like, so I can see why yeah. this made his list. Um, and yeah. I wasn't even driving. I was just sitting in the, in the seat, in the passenger seat. And it was right. Just along for the ride. Scary yeah. ride. Yep. Yep. Uh, skydiving. I hope this is what that means when he's landed in fewer planes than he took off in. Um, hopefully controlled and by desire. Um, right. Hopefully no one threw him off right. of a plane unintentionally. Right. right. <laughs> so he talks a little bit about his undercover work here. He's operated internationally as well as local. He talks about that. Um, we've, we've chatted about that as well. So we'll get some of that information, I hope. And then, um, he's, he likes to climb mountains, which is very interesting. And, um, yeah. And then all the things that you said as well. So a lot of interesting things he didn't put in his official bio, but since he's published that publicly, we thought we'd, uh, dive into it. Cause I think it's pretty fun. It's really fun. And you know what my favorite part about his bio is, is he says the things that I have done and things I continue to do give me the honor to meet people much greater than myself who do more for others than I could ever dream. And I stand humbly in their shadows. Brett's just a cool guy. We're super excited to have him here. Yep. All right. Thanks Lynn. And let's get into it. Let's, let's see what he has to say. All right. And we're back and we have Brett Shavers here with us today. What a great guest to have. And we're very appreciative, Brett, that you're willing to come on and chat with us today. How are you doing today? Oh, great. Uh, thanks for uh, inviting me on. For sure. I'm always happy to get another person from Washington State in here. You know, we got to represent, um, even though you're from the green and pretty side and I'm from the desert yellow side but <laughs> it's yeah. still hot over here yeah it, 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 it's hot on this side today so uh <laughs> brett you know we have a lot to talk about you've got a really cool career you've had we went over some of that in our introduction just for our listeners but one of the things i like to talk with guests about is how you got into forensics like I know in, whether you, I know you're law enforcement, but whether you're law enforcement, there's a lot of different ways to get in enterprise. There's a lot of different ways. So how did, what kind of was the catalyst or how did you jump into this field? What's your origin story? Origin story. <laughs> um, well, I was doing undercover work in law and police work. So I was doing um, 
you know, DEA cases and ICE cases and that kind of stuff. And there was a couple really interesting cases, outlaw motorcycle gangs, some uh, Chinese mafia thing that was flying around and doing a bunch of that stuff. And um, one day I heard about computer forensics and I realized a computer is probably not going to try to kill me. Um, I've had guns in my belly, you know, I've been threatened, I've been patted down, all that other stuff. And I thought, you know what? There might be a better way to do law enforcement work other than the way I was doing it, to what I was doing. So I heard about forensics and I kind of wiggled my way into it. My uh, agency didn't have forensics at all. Actually, they didn't want to do forensics. So I sneaked in a bunch of training. I paid for a lot of my training. Um, I, I sneaked in a lot of training and I self-learned a lot. So um, I volunteered to do some forensic work for some detectives and quickly saw, you know, the evidence that I found on one case in particular that kind of blew me away and blew others away of, oh my gosh, we had one crime, you know, the rape of a child. And it turned out to be a lot more crimes after I went through a bunch of computers. And I said, look, now the guy's looking at life practically. So that's how um, it, it kind of got started was create interest in the agency and uh, and do the actual work. And so they can see a benefit. And it got me out of undercover work. So uh, that was the, uh, the motivation. So you forged your own way. You just went for it. Yeah, I, uh, I did. It, uh, it was not easy. It took about two years. So I was um, going to forensics training at the same time I'm working undercover cases. So I, I would be in you know, San Francisco or Oakland, you know, for some cases. At the same time, I'm studying forensics at night. I'm transcribing body wires. I'm talking to informants and I'm flying to a class, you know, on the East Coast and I'm running cases, you know, through a cell phone. And uh, so it took a while to get there, but it, uh, I finally made it. Get there. off the street and hopefully into an air conditioned office too, you know, hopefully they had AC. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's it's, super interesting because I know yeah. uh, I, I, I always like the ones that are, that choose to get in it and really embrace it. I feel like in the law enforcement side, it's like drinking from the fire hose too. Cause I'm sure once you had those successes, even though at first they didn't want to get into it, then all of a sudden it's like, oh, we've added more time or, oh, hey, we caught this with digital evidence. Now it's like, send all this stuff to shavers, get them all this junk. And then it just piles on. And one thing I've noticed is that, uh, and this is something we want to talk a little bit about later. I've had friends that went the enterprise or the corporate private forensics route. And then of course I went law enforcement and built friends in there. And I just feel like, um, in the law enforcement space, you learn so fast simply because you have to, because the cases are not nonstop. They're like more than nonstop. It's just like, as you're working them, they're still coming in. So it's really a fire hose style of learning. Yeah. It's also the pressure. I mean, in law enforcement, somebody's going to go to jail or they're not going to go to jail. And sometimes they don't go to jail because you do a bad job. Sometimes they don't go to jail because you do a good job. You know, you're finding what actually happened. So that pressure and the time sensitivity of, um, you know, the court dates and the prosecutor wants this, that, and the other. So it's, it's like I said, it's a fire hose because it's um, serious. It's not like a, a lawsuit is important because businesses can, you know, go bankrupt. People can lose their careers and that sort of thing. But someone losing their liberty is a, uh, it's a bigger stress in my mind. So. I also think the, one of the key differences is, I, so I went into straight into forensics, didn't really study much in the e-discovery corporate forensics. I went law enforcement and, um, I've had friends now go corporate and they're like, yeah, all the stuff is just handed to you because it's technically company owned data. So they have to give it to you and all this stuff. Whereas in law enforcement, nobody wants to give you anything and people are actively trying to hide it. And the computer systems that you're working or looking at are always not the best and people aren't as organized. And so it just creates a whole different world of investigation than say private or, or when, when I say private, I mean business or like e-discovery, but. Yeah. On one hand you have a non-cooperating uh, opposing side and the other hand, they cooperate, even though if it's hostile, the judge will say, give up the password or, or else, or give up the computer or else. So it's a, it's a different world. It makes it a bit easier as far as, um, you know, like identifying who did what, uh, the private sector world is a lot easier when you have an employee who uh, typically says, yeah, it's my computer and I was doing it. Um, that's easier than a suspect who has protection to not to incriminate themselves and so different, right. different worlds. 
So on that, so you're going through this and we won't date, put any dates to any of this, but at, at the time, uh, it, you had to learn more than just a tool, you know, you couldn't just be like, Hey, I'm going to pick tool a or B and just learn what buttons. How did you approach that learning of forensics? How, like, were you already a, a computer oriented person or did you have to start like at the basics and kind of jump into it? I think always in the computers, you know, from the Commodore 64 days of playing around and, and basic, you know, programming in, in high school, but nothing really more than just, um, you know, computers, mm -hmm. right? But as far as I'm getting into forensic, that was a whole new world of, um, you know, hexadecimal. You know, it's like, oh my, this is really, a, this is not, <laughs> you know, just basic computer stuff. And as far as the tools go, it was, um, you know, NTI, or, you know, the command line, Dan Mars, um, WinHex before X Waves, yeah. um, Norton Disket, disc Dry Spy, a whole bunch of things that, looking back on it, um, that was the worst forensics anybody could Shame do. With that. <laughs> was just using, yeah, those kind of tools, right? Yeah. Compared to today, right? But at that time, it was, uh, it was you know, safe back for imaging, that sort of thing. So, different world. Uh, learned the hard way, I guess, compared to today is much easier. Yeah. Um, there's college degree programs, and there's your your GUIs and pushing buttons and much easier than it was. I'm not saying it's better or worse. It just just uh, seems to be easier. I think it cuts. I Yeah. Not better or worse. I'm, I'm glad our tools are around because the, the data sizes that we were using, like uh, Norton disc edit on were <laughs> floppy disks and maybe slightly larger hard drives. Right. I would not want to manually decode NTFS. Um, in something like Norton Disk Edit or WinHex or something like that, it right. helps eliminate that heavy lifting. But I will say um, one of the things, so I went the academic route when I got in. So um, I I worked law enforcement straight out of college, but um, my undergrad was in computer information technology. And then I didn't want to be an IT guy. No offense to any IT people listening, just didn't want to do that myself. Um, so I was applying to a police department uh, just to go be a cop. Um, I thought that was that was going to be cool. I, I was really interested in it. And then one of my instructors was like, go get this master's uh, degree from Purdue in cyber forensics. And then you can be a computer cop and, you know, combine these two things. And so that's what I did. And um, even when I got to... Uh, BCI though, it we, we spent so much time um, studying how hard drives store information, like just the mechanics of it and how information is written to a disk. And then we moved on to file systems and how that, and it's crazy how, at least in my experience, that lends to better tool understanding. Like, uh, I don't know, maybe you have some stories or something where I'll get asked by support like, hey, we've got a customer and they're wondering why this isn't being data carved. And you're like, well, because this is how file systems work. And I'm, I'm sure, have you seen those types of benefits in your career, in your cases? Have you had wins that kind of built on that underlying knowledge? Yeah, I think the, uh, the most important, in my opinion, is when you have to testify. And then you're being asked, and if if the opposing counsel is asking questions, and then they they catch on that part that you really don't know, you know a certain thing, um, they're going to drive a wedge in it. I mean, all the way until you're broken. So, at least having that foundation. I mean, you, you don't have to know absolutely everything about a hard drive, or I mean, absolutely everything. But if you know enough to um, justify what you're basing your con your opinions on and conclusions. You're not going to be beaten to death. It's going to be well. It sounds like the person you know they know what they're talking about. So I'm not going to go down that route. But as soon as you don't know something that's kind of basic, as far as you know the the foundation level is, um, that's when it, that's when the pain is going to start. So I try to avoid pain um, by knowing as much as I can, preparing as much as I can, because I, I know I'm going to be asked. You know when you go to court, what kind of case that it is, what kind of evidence that it was. You know the artifacts that you found. You're going to be quizzed on it pretty hard. So that's why I want to know those things and a little bit more just in, just in case. So I think that's the, probably the biggest benefit 
is, um, I mean, you can push buttons and get it all right, but when it comes down to really getting beat up by somebody on, on the stand, um, you can ruin the case, your credibility, your reputation, and uh, won't be sleeping that night very well. Just uh, so I can avoid that stuff. Well, that's one of the perils of being an expert witness such as yourself, right? It's like you earn the right to become an expert witness based on your experience and everything that you've done in your career. But the other side's main goal is to literally just sit and wait if they can discredit you. Right. They're That's just looking intention. for that tiny little yeah. sliver of something yeah. they can grab onto to be like, aha, you know, you, there's, there, we can poke holes in this. So, yeah, unfortunately, you're like, oh, I'm an expert witness. Look at all my experience. Like, I'm finally this like trusted, respected person in court. And the other side's just like, oh, I'm going to get him. I'm going to get this guy. So, yeah, you have to know yeah. to your point. You need to know more than just like, hey, I took a training class and now I'm an expert. That's not that's not the way to do it. Yeah, I took one class in the beginning. It was a five day class and their uh, marketing was. Uh, be a computer forensic expert in five days. And I thought, hey, it sounds good to me. And after that five days, I said, there is no way. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a computer forensic expert. But, you know, that class doesn't exist anymore. But I just thought um, there is no way, you know, one class and you're going to know everything. It's, it's, it's a building up of a lot of, uh, a lot of time and, and effort. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's no quick fix for that. We, um, we work yeah. with a lot of ICAC agents, Internet Crimes Against Children. And um, then from our own experience as well, it's interesting because like learn forensics in five days, but what we hear from a lot of people is it takes them about 10 months before even the person they're training feels confident enough to trust themselves with a case. Um, and I think it probably has something to do yeah. with um, there's a graph of, of perceived intelligence. I can't remember what it's called, but once you start to gain a little bit of knowledge, I think you start to realize, Oh, I, I don't know as much as I thought I did, you know? And, um, I know yeah. when I got hired on at BCI, fortunately I came in with, I'd been working a year with the Lafayette, Indiana police department as well, but they have a year long onboarding process for their computer forensic specialists, because exactly what you're saying, like, there's a lot of stuff. You're not going to know it all, but there's a lot of stuff you need to know. And I even had cases where it'd been, two years after the fact. Um, but during my early time and I'd look at my reports and I'd be like, nothing wrong, but I'm like, why didn't I include this piece of information? Why is this missing from my report? Well, I probably didn't know about it at the time. You know, I'm like, everything's right in here, right. but I could have done so much better, you know? And that's just kind of the growing pains. And I'm sure you found this, uh, forensics is an ever evolving learning pattern you know it's a you can't just be like oh i i took that five-day course and i'm good it's constantly moving yeah yeah five days <laughs> yeah. doesn't do it uh, five days uh that's more of a um an introduction of do you really want to do this job <laughs> because you've got a lot more to go <laughs> and i think that's important i think a class like that um is actually super important i i like what you said like this is the foundation this is the framework of how forensics is going to function this is going to kind of it's almost like the undergrad the the first year of college or something like figure out kind of your trajectory in forensics and and sort it out i know in that vein you've written a number of books and and co-wrote a bunch of others i feel like how, how does that feel when you're writing this book and thinking man forensics moves so quick how you know how do you write it how do you approach a book like that and try to make it as timeless as possible Um, try to be general, but not too general, broad, but, you know, not too broad. It's kind of an impossible task, but cert certain things are, um, they're not going to change. You know, they're just not going to change. It's just yeah. the way, this is the way it works, the way the computer works, that's going to stay the same. So you can use that as a foundation and then say, well, here's some examples on an XP and, a you know, Windows 10 or whatever. And then it's going to change, but at least the foundations are going to be the same. The investigative processes. You know, the mindset's the same. It's, that's, there's not going to, I don't see a, humans developing a new investigative mindset. It's the same as it was, you know, 100 years ago, being curious, you know, and, and testing theories and research and, and documentation. All those are pretty much the same. You can just get better at it. But I think the, the concepts are the same. So I try to write concepts, contextually based information so it can last a lot longer and be more helpful. You know, if, uh, if you have a, if you buy a book that just does, um, let's say Windows 10, forensics 
and it just that's great. But when those, that's going to go away, you know, eventually pretty soon, and and it doesn't affect you know Apple, it doesn't affect a bunch of other things. So I think I'd like to write it more broadly. That's what I like to read as well as um, how do you work a case? Because I mean, for me, when I first started forensics, um, I was doing like uh, international crime type cases. I did some T, you know, the T letter type of investigations kind of stuff too. So my intention was um, whatever tool I could use, I wanted to use it. I had these really neat recording devices, pole cams. Um, I got a National Guard in, in an airplane surveilling us. I mean, a whole bunch of other crazy stuff. So it didn't matter what kind of tool. I just wanted to, to end the case, you know, find out who's who and put them all together and wrap up the case. Forensic, I, I look at this the same way. It's um, I, here's the job I need to do. What tool can I use? What do I have? What's available? So it, it doesn't really matter to me um, which one in particular, it's, as long as it works, does what I need. You know, that's how I look at casework. It's not like, oh, I'm a forensic examiner. It's more like I try to solve a problem and I use whatever tool I have. And I think that mindset Te like teaching that for students is better than teaching, hey, here's a tool, and this tool does everything for you. You know, whatever A, B, C, D tool, whatever it is, it, I think it's better to say, well, here's your problem, and here's a toolbox, and you can pick and choose what does the job. Two or three of those tools might do the exact same job, so then you can pick your preference. I like the way this one looks. I like the way this output is. And then you can work it that way and at least have some input in how you work cases. So that's how I write generally is uh, here's an open book. I think um... – when I'm asked, cause I'll, I'll do these things with like youth and other academic pro programs at college as well. I, I do a middle school one, uh, uh, out of South Dakota every year as well, where I go and present to them. And that's the gist is, is they'll ask, Hey, what should I know to get in or what should I study? And of course, computers is going to help. But what I tell them is just get into the habit of trying to figure out how stuff works and learning like how to learn, which sounds super cliche, but that, that is it. I know one of your books is putting, putting the person behind the keyboard. And like you said, that's not ever going to change. That's the whole th idea of digital forensics and the technology behind it is this ever marching. You mentioned windows 10 and you're like, that'll eventually go away. And I was thinking, man, when we built, um, when we were messing with Windows 10 to try to build a data set for class, it was changing on the monthly. They would have the 20 H11s and the whatever. And I'm like, yeah. even that was like, hey, we ripped this feature out. Well, I just spent a whole chapter writing on that. Well, okay. You know, and <laughs> you've got to learn right. how to learn, you know, and that will, in my opinion, support the buttons that you're going to push to facilitate. It, it almost, the, the tool should be transferring your learning to the case to tell the narrative and hopefully um, we're instilling that. Right. Or just in interpreting. I mean, if we, if we could, if our brain could interpret the data instead of the tool, then we can just look at our hard drive and we can see it. So I just look at the, the tool. It's just that interpreter of you have to look at the data. The tool is going to show you the data. It may say, well, this is kind of suspicious, but you know, I don't know. You have to look. So your, your brain has to look at it and see it. So whatever the tool can interpret it to what you can understand uh, makes all the difference. And I, I'd hate to be a tool developer just because, like you said, the changes, it'd be that I'm too easily frustrated with, with those things. I just want it to work. Uh, you know, if it doesn't work, I got to bang my head. And, and like to your point of um, how to learn, uh, I think that when I, um, I teach at University of Washington the past couple of years and on and off, and one of the things I try to get across to the students is um, it's good to ask questions when you have a question, but it's better if you ask yourself and try to figure it out yourself first, because I mean, obviously there's Google, you know, and, and I, I give that credit. If someone's willing to at least Google it before asking somebody, okay, you get half a point because at least you Googled the answer. Um, but if it's not in Google, if you take the next step, well, let me try to figure out the answer. Well, now you get a full point because you're actually learning to learn. And if you just right off the bat, just ask for the answer. Yeah, that's not that's not the way that you're going to succeed in the field. If, if you're always at, turning to your partner and saying, hey, how do, how do you do this? 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 Eventually, it's like, yeah, you need a new job. Um, it's, it's not fit for what the way you're the way you work. I, I have you um, met or talked with Paul Sanderson of Sanderson Forensics? Yeah, yeah. I uh, tech edited help one of his tech editors for his uh, sequel forensic. Oh, book. perfect. So I we were working with him years ago, and 
SQLite is like a hobby of mine, which can you get much nerdier than that? But I just love for whatever reason. No, you can you can't get nerdier than I know. that. I mean I love I'll writing SQLite queries and messing around with databases, <laughs> but I would drive him nuts, I'm, I'm sure, because I would bang my head against the wall trying to figure this out. Then I'd send him an email, and that was what it would take for me to figure it out because then he would get another email 10 minutes later. Ne never mind. Here's here's my query. Uh tweak it if you whatever, but I think I figured it out. And I got another buddy with my Python programming. Uh, scripting that I do the same thing, bang my head against the wall. The second I ask the question, it's like the universe is like, yep, that's all you needed to do. Now I'm going to solve it. And you're going to have to send another chat out <laughs> that you've, you, it's just, a, it, it, yeah, you, it's a spark. You know, you could do inspiration of your brain, you know, thinking. So when, maybe when you ask the question, then you realize the question, right? So it's um, now I know what I'm asking for. So, cause, cause I heard myself. Yeah, so. exactly. Yeah. One thing I wanted to ask you, if you, so one of the things I haven't applied for a job in a long time, but <laughs> uh, it seems like when you look at these things, especially for university students, as you teach there and we interface with them, it's almost like we need to do more messaging to the companies. Because if you look at an application, it's never like, um, well, sometimes it is, but it it's usually like, hey, it has experience with, you know, Xtero's FTK or whatever. It's rarely like, can you come in and talk to me about file systems or whatever? How do we message that to, because that's going to be the better employee, or is that just too hard to quantify? I think it's, um, and I'm just guessing, you know, and it, it's when you have an organization that invests into a certain enterprise suite of whatever tools, I think it's easier to hire someone who knows that tool rather than replace that tool because somebody gets hired and says, yeah, I don't like that one. There's a better one. So I think for one, there's that financial, of, well, you know, we bought this thing. We're, we're set for it. Um, let's just hire people who can use it. And obviously you're not getting someone who can solve. I mean, you, you could be getting people who can solve problems, but you're not getting people who can solve problems based on the problem. You're getting people who can work a software and hopefully they can solve your problem. So I don't think there's a solution to um, that. I, I, I guess the only thing you could do is needs to be able to solve a kind of this kind of problem using this this suite. Mm -hmm. We use this suite, so if you can solve these kind of problems with this suite, and then that's what we're looking for. If you just say, "Can you use this suite? We want to hire you," um, you're getting someone who can push some buttons. Maybe they took a college class, and you know that's about it. So I, I don't think there's a solution for that, and that's just monetary because that's a company who. Um, yeah, but some companies I I've seen many that will what tool do you want to use? Go buy it and you can use it here. And I think that is a better way to solve problems because you may have five people using five or 10 different tools and none of them are cross using, but you have people who are using tools that they like, they know, and they're, you know, their expertise in it and the company can benefit because the problems are getting solved. It's not based on, you know, a, a vendor says, Hey, we, we can solve all your problems. I think it's better to say many vendors can come in and say, yeah, we can all solve these problems with different people because everyone likes different things. Yeah. Um, some people like the way a program looks. Well, we talk about that all the time. Like you can use one tool to validate the results of another tool. You should yeah. have two tools. I mean, that's a smart thing to do. You should know more than one tool yourself, right? Should. <laughs> yeah. But I, yeah. ideally, but again, because, you know, college programs either, I don't think, um, Many of them, some of them do really prepare, you know, internships, apprenticeships, um, and even job placement. But a lot does don't. They um, they say here's some some information on forensics, and uh, here's a tool, and then here's your your certificate or your degree, and that's really it. Does businesses a disservice? It does the students a disservice. Um, colleges got their tuition, but it's not solving a problem. So I think it's a combination of, and there are schools and universities that work with corporations. Um, it just needs to be a better communication because you have different goals. You know, the, the schools want students right? and the corporations want competence and it, it doesn't match all the time. It's interesting. We just saw, we saw two articles. Um, an older one was saying that uh, there was a 600,000 person shortage in cybersecurity fields. Uh, ranging from forensics to infrastructure security, all that sort of stuff. And a later article that we just got, or not, we didn't get it, but we saw it two weeks ago was it was up over 700,000. So it's getting worse. And I, I think that 
companies, even uh, software vendor companies, but especially the end user of forensic workflows should be, we're looking, I think, to partner with these universities, work internships, scholarships, those types of things, if they want to entice students into it. And I personally think this field is uh, pretty good, you know, having been in it for a while and you've been in it for a while, but that's an interesting concept of, you know, we're not, we're not really optimizing the college or university or learning experience to motivate, I think, as many people as we can to get into the field that they would enjoy. There's a lot of in bureaucracy and internal politics. In, and I think, I think a few years ago, I was involved with the university and setting up a program. And it was the first time, actually, that I was from the ground level starting that, you know, help with this program. And I have never seen, experienced such politics within one university of how each department works together or works against each other and the goals of each department and me just trying to put together the program of my intention is at least they can walk out the door. They can do a, a basic exam, you know, at a minimum and more so hopefully, but the school's goals are different really. And I think, and when you throw in businesses in there too, those goals are different as well because schools have certain things we, where we have to teach this, we have to teach that, and we have to throw in these other unnecessary things in my mind, unnecessary, or why spend so long on this when you can really need to spend it on something else. So I think it's a, it's a tough job, and you're going to have to have the right people in, in the school and the right you know connections in, in whatever corporation and try to build a program that way. And it's been done, but it's just, it's a tough one, yeah. you know, to put together. Absolutely. I think law enforcement has a great system for the federal level where you have um, I don't know. You know, the uh, Fletzy two week program. Have you heard? Mm -hmm. So it used, used to be you know, when that came out, it was two weeks and then they also would come back and now they're doing forensics. And um, you know, that two week class is it's, it's like that five day be an expert class. I mean, you're, you're throwing here's a bunch of tools. Here's a laptop and here's a bunch of dongles. Now you're certified. And that's really a bad way, I think. But they have the other the longer version, you know, uh, P cert, B cert and all these other things and like months in a classroom. So like I spent a month, just one full month. Yeah, I'm just learning computers and building computers another month just on software another month on networks so when you have a system like that coming coming out of that I think that's more valuable for competence than a probably a master's degree because it's it's eight or ten hours a day and you're doing casework I mean you're serving fake warrants you're actually you're digging data and you're testing you're writing reports you're doing that for three or four months you come out pretty well ahead as someone, a student, and that's because of the college is different. The academic level is different. If you're if you're lucky, you get some good solid classes, but if you have to take, you know, a year of um, non computer related classes, you know, that's that's a lot of time to be spending. That I would rather spend, you know, how do I dig into this Linux box? How do I dig into this Mac OS rather than, you know, historical, <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, history lessons of something else? So. It's a, it's a tough job. Yeah. No shade at uh no shade at Purdue where I went, but I felt the same way where I I did a two years master's program, but one year of that, in addition to the coursework, I was working with the Lafayette Indiana Police Department. And honestly, like that was that's what like I guess gave me the the schooling kind of gave me the stuff, you know, but like that one year internship of working real cases with the detectives in the, in the CSI team and all that sort of stuff that you learn so much more actually mm -hmm. hands-on in doing stuff than any classroom um, taught me while I was there. And that's no shade against them. That's just kind of how the academic programs everywhere are set up. Well, I think since Central, since we're both in Washington, two out, two out of four of us, uh, Central Washington University, I think, has a really good apprentice program. And I, and from what I remember, I, I was there doing some lecture stuff. The students actually work real cases with the local police departments. I mean, they actually do casework while they're a student. That's great. And I said, wow, that's, that is the best way. Because if you're getting the academic and you're getting real life, someone's going to go to jail, not go to jail kind of case um, experience, it, obviously being supervised by people who uh, have a badge, but you can't beat that kind of experience of learning, you know, if you can get the academic and the real world at the same time. Just doing the real world, it's painful and stressful, 
because um, if you, especially if you're the only one, because there's no one to check your work really per se. But as a student, it'd be nice to have uh, that kind of apprenticeship where someone's actually checking your work. Uh, so you're learning and doing real stuff and take back to the class, write a report. Absolutely. You know, I did a, I did a good case. You know, here's my report, you know. Uh, yeah. I also think, and, and this is maybe the wrong way to look at it, but I, it works out, I think is, I think you learn if you can handle it or not um, in a, in a environment where like, if I have never done anything and I go through the whole hiring process and, you know, some agency has, has invested in me and all of a sudden you get in and you're like, I, I can't handle this for whatever reason, man, it's tough to get out. You feel that pressure. Maybe you're going to burn out. You're going to have some issues in different areas. Whereas if, as a student, you're in a internship or a partnership there, you do it for a year and you're like, man, I, I can't do it. I can't do it. Well, you still have a computer degree. You still have whatever you can you can go into something else. You're still in school technically, if you want to totally divert out. Um, and I think that helps get not just from the skill wise, but you get people that know what they know, what they're kind of coming into a little more than, Hey, I graduated with this degree. I want to do forensics. What's in that? Well, we're going to show you. <laughs> yeah. Well, which brings up a good point. I was given a lecture at, at one college and um, during a break, one of the students came up to me, asked me a question about, um, this is a program. I was speaking to this particular program and he comes up to ask me questions. When do we start learning, you know, about what he thinks he's in? And I said, I th you're in the wrong program. I go, this, this one is not that one. I said, you just spent a lot of money in the wrong thing, but it made me think at that time. So I changed that, that lecture of um, who, who really wants to be here kind of a thing, because there are different paths to take. And this program is this path. And if you don't like that one, well, there's another path, you know, I mean, you have the IR type and you have the forensic thing set up. You really have to know from the start what fits your personality. So like you said, when someone gets into something and they later say, well, that's not for me. I think from the beginning, if they can see, well, what are my choices? Um, what's my personality? Because you have the firefighter type of personality. It's just fire running a building, you know, everything's on fire. <laughs> you know, that's not me. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not that kind of person. And then you have like the detective personality of, okay, I'm going to figure out who killed this person. I'm going to figure out who hacked this machine. I'm going to dig in it. I'm going to spend time on it. There's no, I mean, there's rush, but there's not, I'm looking at every single bit and bite. And I are, you just want to um, stop the fire, stop the bleeding, you know? So those are two different personality types. So I think if students, if, if the colleges can figure those out for the students, right? Do you want to be a firefighter or, or a detective, right? Because you're going to waste your time mm -hmm. If you're not, and you you may go all the way the forensic route, graduate even to a graduate degree, do the actual job and say, this job sucks. I don't know why I picked it and go work someplace else doing something completely different. When had they gone the IR route, they could have ended up and said, this is exactly what I wanted to do. It fits me perfectly. So not knowing which one, I think that's the biggest, the first, I get asked a lot, how do I get into forensics? Well, you can be a firefighter or a detective because that's the first question to ask. And everything else is based off of that. Your training, the things you read, the jobs that you're going to do. Otherwise, like you said, you, you, you get hired and you go, this job sucks. <laughs> you know, this is not what I expected because it's the wrong one. <laughs> yeah. Right. You run, you run a, you run a training website, correct? You have DFIR training uh, or www.dfir.training for those of you at home who want to look that up. What, what kind of training do you offer? Are you still actively offering yeah, I, training I now? Put together some of my own classes. Um, I had a, a lot. I'm updating a whole bunch now, and I'm still putting them together when I have time. And I have a major one that I'm actually uh, starting on. Um, so, well, let me talk about the major one. Is uh, it's, it's placing a suspect kind of keyboard. So I'm, I'm putting together that course now, and it's probably going to take me about six months or so, just because it's kind of a it's a labor intensive thing. So it's, it's kind of based on the, the book that I wrote by the same, it, you know, let me back up uh, just one minute is um, when I was working in NARCS and I'm, I'm brand new and I'm doing a NARCS and vice, you know, and gambling, you know, and I'm in a, a low level NARC unit, just me and my partner, and I'm getting these cases from patrol officers. You know, they pull somebody over, they found some crack and they arrest the person, they send me the case. And that's, it was, I pulled it over and arrested for crack. And that's basically all I get. And I go, how do I file this case? I mean, I mean, there's three people in a the car, right? And, and they arrested one and, 
and so I got to figure out. So I have a nice partner. I go, how do you, how do you figure it out? We got to figure it out. Well, how do you put that crack in somebody's hand, right? If it's in the middle of the car and the car belongs to a third party, you know, reporters say, oh, those are the craziness. So then it, it's one of those, well, the circumstantial evidence, okay, um, who had the key to the car, witnesses, all these other things put together. And that's how I would came up with the idea with the forensic placing a suspect behind a keyboard book was, well, how do you put a case together and, and pin this on somebody who did it? So I'm revising that book to probably twice the size and updating home and stuff in the course to go along with it. So that's kind of a class that's coming up in, like I said, a couple of months. And it's going to have a bunch of different software. Actually, it's going to have like a dozen plus software examples. So you can see, okay, um, this software looks like this. It does this. This other software does this one. And people can actually put together a case using the book in the class and how to think out of it in, in the beginning. Because if you don't know, if your goal is, I just want to run software. Well, you're not going to solve any cases. You know, um, hey, I found a deleted file. So what? It, it, it's meaningless in court. It's meaningless for a case or a business. You have to say, well, who deleted it? How did it get there? Where did it go from there? Did it co get copied? And how do you know that? How can you prove that? Was it downloaded? Those are the things that put together a case. And I think that's the mindset of what this book and the, the new book I'm writing in, in the course is. Other courses are great, like um, anything on software vendors, courses. Absolutely. Um, I advocate evangelists for all of them because being trained by the developer of a course is, um, I mean, it's, I think it's pretty important for your CV, for your resume, and to know that you got some good good information. So I always do that. I've seen people on the stand get questioned, have you been trained in this and I can tell you one, well, I'm not going to say, anyway, I've been trained this particular tool and the person said, no, but I've used it for, you know, two years or three years and got slammed, you know, for, uh, and the next thing you know, after the case, you know, we're talking and he says, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to sign up for a class, you know, from that vendor because uh, that was terrible to understand. I go, I know. I said, um, if I'm using a tool, if there is training for it, I will have taken a class or more. If there's no training provided, I'm going to really research it. I'm going to write something about it to show that I, I posted it on the internet. I used it. There is no training. I use it enough. I wrote about it and I did cases on it. So I think those are very useful. But the other part of the equation is you have to be able to investigate. You have to have that mindset of, um, I got to figure this problem out no matter what the tool is. Tool is just a sideline thing. I got, I got to figure out the problem. So that's what this course and book is. That's the major long answer to a short question of yes is the, uh, the answer. <laughs> No, that's great. So people can get that book now, Placing the Suspect Behind the Keyboard. And then you said you are currently working on a second version of that, a bigger version. So that's, yeah. we can all look forward yes. to that. I'd, I'd probably just wait okay. until the new version comes out if you don't want to spend the money on it. Because uh, that one's like 10 years ago. This one's going to be kind of a major, it's a major labor. But it should be, it's for my benefit too, because I only I write things that would they benefit me. I mean, every book that I write, I have my own books on my shelf. So I look at what I wrote before just to make sure. And, and that's it's, it's a good refresher. It's, um, it's inspiration. If you're stuck in a case of, well, let me take a step back. Let me read something. And it's, oh yeah, you know what? I can think this way. I can look at it from a different perspective. And that's kind of how I write books for everybody and myself too. Do you still, uh, cause you've had a long career as we've just talked about, do you still, I hope the answer is yes. Do you still get jazzed up? You know, when you're working an actual case, you're a consultant. Someone's asked you to work with them, government agency, corporation, you know, whatever kind of case it is. Like, do you still get excited when you're like, I did place the suspect behind the keyboard. I did figure it out. Like, I did solve this problem. I mean, do you still, like, do you still get that? I don't know what feeling you guys get when you do this, but it's like, oh, I yeah. got it. Like, how does that feel for you now? Even after really, all just years? every time. It's just, uh, just every time. <laughs> so, yeah, it's always good to um, to prove or disprove because there's. It, I've seen, I've done you know both yep. of um, you know have an open mind and when you can say, oh my gosh, this absolutely did happen or absolutely did not happen. I think it's uh, it's always a good feeling. Um, sometimes it's it's um, uncomfortable conversations with your client when it doesn't go the way your client wants it to go, but it's still a good feeling to say, oh, at least I know you know what really happened. Or little things. That's right. Nobody might like the outcome, but at least we know definitively right. what happened. Yeah, for sure. I think that's yep. the thing I missed the most since I jumped out of full time investigations is there's a tangible dopamine hit when you like, like you said, either way it goes, you, you alibi make or alibi break. 
at the at that point and it's it's tangible and i don't i don't know how to describe it but it's tangible especially um like when you do something that <laughs> and this is like i guess prideful for all of us but like when you do something that required like legit work like oh i rebuilt this database or i researched this and figured out how to you know put this information back together then it then it's like a couple extra shots of dopamine and um you're ready for the next case and i think a lot of that is what keeps everybody going um but it feels so good to uh finish those cases and and make those breaks i think yeah, well, there's a lot of, one of the things I learned from law enforcement to private, my first private sector case was a, a kind of a big case and I uh, did a great job, I, I felt. And I wrote a big report and I emailed the report to the attorney in New York. And I, as soon as I emailed it, he had called my desk and he's yelling and screaming like a New York attorney. And uh, he said, I'm not, he goes, I'm not <laughs> even gonna that. read this thing. He goes, I just wanna know, did he do it or not? And I said, yes, he did it. He goes, that's all I needed to know. He hung up the phone and I thought, well, they just want to know <laughs> yes or no. So kind of depending on the client, it's a, they just want to know the answer. So when you can find the answer, sometimes it's not rebuilding databases and this, oh, I spent 40 hours doing this and then I did this and all they want to know is, dude, just tell me, did you, did you find out or not? And it's like, yeah, I found out. And that's the dopamine for them. And that's when I say, okay, they're, they're happy. They're, they think it was magic. Sometimes it's magic when you're rebuilding everything. Um, but I mean, just there was an attorney who had called me uh, doing a deposition on somebody. And I said, you know, I can help you. If I can be there. And he goes, oh, no, I'm fine. So I said, well, if you need me, just call me. So he sends me a text. He goes, he goes, hey, can you find out if during the break of the deposition, he goes, uh, can you find out if anything was plugged into this computer? So I just run a quick, you know, search. And uh, I mean, like what, 60 seconds. And I sent back, yeah, these are the devices. And I didn't hear back until the afternoon. And the, the, I called the attorney, he goes, well, did it work out? And he goes, as soon as I told him the devices and the date and times, he folded like a cheap card table. And the whole deposition was, so it was like magic for him that in less than a minute, he had something that really made his case. And for me, it was like, yeah, that was the easiest money made was uh, just running for the connected devices. But for them, they don't really not care, you know, how long it takes, how much time and money, they just want the answer. So that's the, the satisfaction I get is uh, seeing them think that it's magic. Yeah, they want that actionable. We internal. talk about that a lot. Yeah, we talk about that a lot here being part of Xtero. Um, you know, there's always that question of, well, how are your forensic tools different from these e-discovery tools, right? And so we always have to give that explanation of, well, we can absolutely, you know, figure out where what's in the email or what was written in that letter or what someone said or what someone wrote or what they did. But then when you can say, well, that picture actually didn't originate on that computer. We know it was sent from a different kind of phone and this is where, you know, when it was sent and where it was taken and who took the photo. And then you start naming off, like, I know what device you were on, where you were, what network you weren't connected to, you know, what you're doing. And people are like, oh, shoot. Yeah. All right, you got me now, right? Like, I, it's not just, you know, oh, see, it wasn't me. It wasn't on, you know, wasn't on my phone. And we're like, well, we found it on another phone and we know it came from your phone. Um, that's the forensic, that's the extra layer of forensics where we're peeling back just what was in the file or what the picture looked like. It was like, well, how did we get that picture in the first place? Where did it originate? So, uh, yeah, that's a great, that's a great example of, you know, I, I, I found the information and I can verify to you exactly right. where we found it. That's the fun part. That's the magic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. yep. One thing, um, Brett, I want to, I, I want to kind of close with here cause we've been going for a while, but is you are working on a new book right now. Details are still, I wanted to ask this question too. Uh, yes. Uh, you can find out more on his blog, but Brett, what, what do you want to say <laughs> about that? what you're working on. I know you, you did a blog post, so I'm not going to say anything more yeah. than the blog post. I'll leave it up to you. Yeah. Um, it's a case that I had nothing to do with. So um, <laughs> I can only give credit to Mark Spencer from Arsenal, you know, his, his tools and things. And he has a, a couple of great cases that he's still working on. And it's a really good case that he did. And it kind of, it kind of comes down to um, the government corruption, planning of digital evidence, political prisoners, um, people dying in prison, I mean, on, on bad evidence and a, and a bunch of other forensic entities 
looking at the, this evidence and nobody finding, you know, their true evidence. And Mark Spencer did. Him and his team found uh, this the real evidence, and it really changed up, healed everything. So it's a great story. It's uh, international news. It's all over the news. If you pay attention, if you ever see those things, and it's kind of real life. So the book is um, it's kind of a different kind of forensic book that I've never read before or definitely never written before either. And uh, so Mark and I are both writing it together. And um, it's kind of like a, I'd say a cross between Tom Clancy and Harlan Carvey Wendell's forensics. It's um, you have a real life historical, not historical nonfiction story going along at the same time that you were going to talk about the forensic aspect of it. Uh, this is what happened in this forensic aspect. This is how it was found. This is how it got there. So it's kind of that kind of an action book in forensics, but it's really people died in it. And the forensic work actually changed a lot of things, changed history, really, where the government wanted to go one way, but actually the truth is coming out. So it's kind of a, it's a pretty, pretty neat book to be done next year. Um, I actually got to finish it by cha a chapter uh, soon <laughs> to send in. But uh, it's uh, a lot of work, uh, very unique, and we'll probably do a lot of rewrites because uh, I said it's a un uniquely written book. It's like a case study, and it's still actually ongoing. So it's uh, so that's what we're working on. It should be good. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Well, I'll be yeah, looking forward I'm to excited. it, especially if it gets on audiobook because that's how I typically consume it. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> you never know. But uh, perfect. It'll make it go. to Netflix. Don't worry. It sounds like a Netflix original. I'm, I'm ready for uh, that. <laughs> Tom Clancy, man, those were the types of books. I just, I, I read a ton of them uh, years ago. It was just like, that was my jam. So I'm all on board. Uh, Brett, thanks again for joining us and talking to us about forensics and training and what you got going on. A lot of great stuff. Thanks again for coming on. Thanks for having me. And remember, you can find Brett all over the place, right? You can ha find him at brettshavers.com, his website. You can find him at dfir.training if you want to look at all his free resources for the for the DFIR community. Um, he has an amazing website, you know, great blog. You know, he's always commenting on things. There's so many things you can pick up and, again, go to Amazon, <laughs> get his books. There's so much you can learn uh, from Brett. And, yeah, we're, we're, we're hoping that folks – folks start investigating a little more what you are doing and see if that will be helpful and applicable for them and their career, right. And their, their experience and, uh, you know, giving them a little bit of extra, extra training to make them a better, better forensic professional. Absolutely. So plenty of ways to find Brad out in the world and even more coming soon. That will be so much more dramatic than we've ever seen <laughs> yeah, before. That's right. yeah. Can't wait. Yeah. <laughs> 